Hello friends, this is Homer Knox of MenTeachingMen.com. In this video, we're going to be studying the Epistle to the Galatians, chapters 1 and chapter 2. We will be using the New American Standard and King James Version Bibles for our scripture translation in this video. In this video, we're going to be looking at the Apostle Paul's Epistle or Letter to the Galatian Church. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Vernon McGee with Through the Bible radio series for his insights that he has given me on his teaching. He's gone to be with the Lord, but I want to give him his due. I've enclosed the link below to his website. Epistle to the Galatians, the introduction. Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament, a letter from the Apostle Paul to a number of early Christian communities in Galatia or central Turkey, which probably he founded. It was written from 40 to 60 AD, possibly the earliest church or epistle that the Apostle Paul wrote. The churches were made up of Gentile converts, not Jewish converts. The Apostle Paul got some type of sickness during his second missionary travels, and he recuperated in Galatia. Even though sick, we see Paul continuing to minister, and that's how this church started. He also visited the Galatia churches in his third missionary journey. The purpose of the letter to the Galatians. The Apostle Paul is concerned with the movement of this church from trusting and faith in Christ for salvation to a legalistic belief, a belief of rules and regulations. And the purpose of this letter was to counteract this false teaching. At some time after the Apostle Paul's departure from Galatia, a group, possibly Jewish Christians, came to the Galatian church and they taught that the Galatians must abide by the Jewish law, legalism, to obtain salvation. Paul describes this as a different gospel. Paul argues that the Gentile Galatians do not need to adhere to the Mosaic or the Moses law. The message from Paul to the churches is stern and severe. This church was in great peril. There are no words of thanksgiving, commendation, or praise from the Apostle Paul in this letter. The heart of Paul is laid bare here. We can call this his fighting epistle. Paul is not discrediting the Jewish law. It is not disregarded, but it cannot bring salvation to man. Only faith in the blood of Jesus can do that, not by the works of the law. Romans 3.20 Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. The Galatians appear to have been receptive to the legalistic teaching of these newcomers. This epistle is Paul's response to what he sees as the Galatians' willingness to turn from the true gospel. Smith's Bible Dictionary describes the Galatian people that they have always been susceptible to a quick impression and sudden changes, with the fickleness equal to their courage and enthusiasm. That sort of sounds like America, doesn't it? The epistle to the Galatians was Martin Luther's favorite epistle. It's been called the Magna Carta of Christian living. Justification by faith. We can only obtain salvation by faith in the blood of Christ Jesus. Paul argues that the Gentile Christians do not need to adhere to the tenets of the Mosaic Law. Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 1. Galatians, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. The Apostle Paul is outlining his authority as an apostle, made so by God, not men. The definition of an apostle is one sent by another, a messenger, an envoy. Meaning of the term apostle. Apostle is one sent by another, a messenger, an envoy. The apostle was sent by God. There are many sent in the world today, but few are sent by God. Unfortunate, unfortunate. We are extremely thankful for the ones truly sent by God. Verses 2 to 3. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If you want to have peace, you will need to have grace first. You can only get grace by receiving Jesus Christ, and then peace will come. Grace. Meaning of the word grace. Getting what you don't deserve. Getting what you don't deserve. Grace through Jesus Christ. Verses 4 and 5. Who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Boy, this statement is still true today. Jesus gave himself to man in Paul's age and every age, came to rescue us from this evil age. Well, this is still true today. This is an evil age, and it's becoming more and more evil daily. We can certainly say amen to this verse. To Jesus be the glory forevermore. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. The word amazed is used 41 times in the New American Standard Bible. But this is the only time that Paul uses the word in his writings. He was amazed. Possibly the Galatian church was the only one that he had started to corrupt itself. Our goal in Christ is not to distort the simple gospel message in the church or in our hearts. There is only one gospel message. Verse 7, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and wanting to distort the gospel of Christ. For many individuals and groups, distortion of the gospel is their goal. Some a little, some a lot. Well, why? Why would they want to do that? There's possibly several reasons. One might be that they have control over you. Or the other, possibly they want to deny you entrance into glory. And that would be the enemy. He wants everyone to go to hell with him. Verse 8, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to which you have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Verse 9, As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. That's pretty strong language by the Apostle Paul. This is one of the reasons it is necessary, important to have strong spiritual men and women of faith in church leadership's positions. If their pastors sway somewhat, as we're going to see later with the Apostle Peter, they can help and correct. Thank you, Jesus, for the strong spiritual men and women in church leadership. Bless them. Verse 10, For am I now seeking the favor of men, or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I am still striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Trying to please men? Churches will grow if they focus on pleasing men and not the salvation message of Jesus' sacrifice. And there are a ton of churches out there that are men pleasers. Let's not offend. The gospel message is offensive to many. Bond servants are required to be truthful. And the truth of the gospel is by receiving Jesus by faith only. Works arise as we walk with Christ. Verses 11 to 12. For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The apostle is now giving his salvation experience testimony. God gave him a revelation of himself. I received the gospel in the living room of Reverend Leroy Waters. Pastor Waters explained the gospel to me, and I received Jesus Christ into my heart. But not so with the apostle Paul. Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul. How glorious, how glorious. There are many other persons where Christ revealed himself to them. Paul is now going to share about his former life and is moving to a position of leadership of the Gentile church. Verse 13, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Verse 14, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen. 
being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. The Apostle Paul's former life. Number one, he was a persecutor of the church. Number two, he was advancing in Judaism. And number three, he was jealous for ancestral traditions. We know from the Apostle Paul letter to the Philippian church that he counted all this as lost. Philippians, the third chapter, verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surprising value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Galatians, the first chapter, the 16th verse. To reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. Set apart from my mother's womb. That's why we do not support abortion. We are a living individual even in the womb. Precious in the sight of God. Abortion is murder to the Christian church. Galatians 17 to 18. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. The Apostle Paul was sent to the desert for training. God had previously used the desert to train other leaders, Moses, Abraham, Elijah, David, Paul is a new Christian, less than three years from his conversion, and God is going to train him in the desert. Verses 19 to 20. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Verses 21 to 23. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, I was still unknown by the sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only. They kept hearing, He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. Good news travels fast, doesn't it? Travels fast. Verse 24, And they were glorifying God because of me. How wonderful to have good news concerning any individual. Paul was a mess, but we hear that he not only straightened up, but that he is assisting with preaching the faith. Did you ever know anyone that was a sinner, a mess? But after they got saved, they straightened up, and then they started ministering. Well, that's with most people, isn't it? We were all a mess till we got saved. It is wonderful to see what God can do. Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2, verse 1. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. The timeline for the Apostle Paul to meet with all the leadership in Jerusalem is at least 17 years from Paul's salvation experience. The timeline for Paul's Jerusalem meetings. Number one, Paul accepts Jesus Christ. Number two, Paul goes away to Arabia. Number three, Paul returns to Damascus. Number four, Three years later, Paul meets with Peter and James. Number five, Paul travels to Syria and southwest Turkey. Number six, 14 years later, Paul travels to Jerusalem to meet with the Christian church leadership. Verse two, it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. This is just a very interesting verse, very interesting. Revelation, a disclosure from God. Either God spoke to him, or he had a vision, or a word from God. Maybe someone prophesied over the Apostle Paul. Revelations from God are wonderful, and people are still getting revelations from God today. Paul did so in private. Well, that's a smart move in the Apostle Paul's part. What happened when he did it again in public? He was arrested, he was put on trial, he was sent to Rome, and eventually he was killed. The Jewish leadership was all worked up over this guy. He was one of us, a Pharisee. He was one of us, and now he's preaching Christ. Did you ever feel you needed affirmation on what you were doing, possibly in ministry? I 
I have, let's check with our pastors, our church leadership, or spiritual friends for confirmation or correction. Correction is good. Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 26 and 27. When he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him. The Jewish disciples were afraid of Paul. I guess they were. Paul was a persecutor of the church, a persecutor of believers, a nasty guy before he got saved. The Jerusalem disciples did not originally believe he was a disciple of Christ. Can you blame them? Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement, was known as a follower of Christ to the Jerusalem church. Barnabas brought Paul to the apostle. Hey, this guy's okay. Verse 3, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. The apostle Paul and the others were making a presentation to Jewish believers of Christ. Even though the Jerusalem leadership had a Jewish background, they didn't force circumcision on Paul's ministry team. Verses 4 to 5. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. False brethren. Obviously, they were followers of the Mosaic laws, unsure if they were believers or not believers. Peter and the church leadership did not compel Titus to be circumcised. Salvation is based on faith in Jesus Christ, not the Jewish law. Verse 6, But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. High reputation. A little bit of Paul's individuality coming out here. The Jerusalem church leadership thankfully didn't make any changes to Paul's gospel message. Verse 7. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For he who effectively worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectively worked for me also to the Gentiles. Same gospel, but different audiences. Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. Both successfully. Thank you, Jesus. John, the 12th chapter, verse 32. Jesus is speaking. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Verse 9, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reported to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Hey, we see the works, the grace and the power of the Apostle Paul's ministry, what the Holy Spirit is doing through Paul. How can we refuse him? or not bless him, or not encourage him. James, Peter, and John's blessing are desired and needed for unified ministry. There is not going to be two church branches, just one, the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Oh man, the poor. Sometimes we forget about the poor, don't we? Our family was fortunate that we attended a church for many years that specialized in helping the poor. Brother, let me encourage you to give to the poor. Give to ministries that help the poor. Giving to the poor through a gospel ministry is important. I occasionally give to individuals, but my normal way of giving is through gospel ministries that specialize in helping the poor. Verse 11, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. Verse 12, For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw 
and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. Group dynamics can change the way we think and behave, and we must be careful of this. One time I was at a new work situation, and we were all talking at break, and one of the persons out of the blue said, well, none of us are Christians here. I said nothing, but I just raised my hand, and that ended that break talk for that day. Peter got caught up with the legalistic Jews, holding himself aloof from the Gentile believers. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. This spiraled out of control and needed correction. Thank goodness Paul was the vehicle to bring them back into focus and acting truthfully. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews? No fooling with Paul. In the presence of everyone, he corrects, rebukes Peter. The separation of Gentiles from Jews was an issue they have already dealt with in Jerusalem. Let's get over it. Gentiles do not have to comply with the Mosaic law. The Jews couldn't follow the law successfully themselves. We can certainly respect someone who corrects us to our face instead of behind our back. Verse 15, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. The Jewish people considered Gentiles sinners, and they were since they did not follow the Jewish law. But when Christ died and was resurrected and was started to be preached, many Gentiles received Christ, and that all changed. Justified by faith. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. The word man here means mankind, everyone, not justified by the works of the law or any legal system. You must join, you must follow, you must behave, all have nothing to do with being justified in God's sight. Justified means just as I didn't sin. Some of these things are good and worthwhile, but they do not make the person free from sin. The distorters wanted to move from belief and faith to do. You have to do this, you have to do that. Do has nothing to do with the gospel. Belief is the foundation of our faith. Verse 17, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners. Is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. Justified, just as we didn't sin, declared to be righteous on the basis of faith. The bottom line of this verse is that we are sinners by our nature which we got from Adam's sin. Verse 18, for if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be the transgressor. Paul is saying that if I go back to believing that rules and regulations will save me, I become a transgressor again. That road doesn't sound very good, does it? Verse 19, for through the law I died to the law, so I might live to God. Because of not being able to keep the law, I died to the law. So the law leads me to Jesus Christ's blood sacrifice that I can now live righteously before God. Amen. Praise God. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, the question is, when were we crucified with Christ? when he died for us as a substitute for our sins. Christ indwells us. We have this Holy Spirit in us, so now we can live in Christ. Our lives are now centered around Christ. We now live by faith in Jesus. We are saved by faith, live by faith, walk by faith. We have also been crucified and also buried with him. God loved me when I was a sinner. 
Christ took the punishment for our sins. He gave himself up for me. Therefore, I live for him. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism unto death. Buried with him by identification. I identify with Christ. Galatians 2.21 I do not nullify. King James uses the word frustrate. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. The word frustrate means to despise, to render useless, to abolish, to make void. Christ would have died needlessly if we are still required to follow the law. Thank you so much for watching this video on Galatians, the introduction, chapters 1 and chapter 2. I hope they have been a blessing to you. God bless you. God bless you greatly. Amen. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men Teaching Men YouTube channel. Hello, friends. This is Homer Knox again. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day. He's now ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. There is salvation in no one else, no one else. And so if this has stirred your heart and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins, all my sins by your precious blood. I accept you as my personal Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for my home in heaven. Thank you for giving me the Holy Spirit and making me a new creature. Amen and amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, you're now born again. You're a Christian. Welcome. Welcome to the family. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're now part of the family. You're back in the fold. Welcome. Congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved. And that video will help you with your new walk in Jesus Christ. God bless you. God bless you. Amen.